Good evening and welcome to a special presentation where we're going to talk about dark skies. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the historian and public information officer at Lowell. Good evening and welcome. And I'm pleased to host this program tonight, which is sponsored by Grand Canyon National Park, Grand Canyon Conservancy, uh, Low Observatory, and the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. Um, the dark skies in Northern Arizona are linked so closely from the beginning of the dark skies movement until today. And we're gonna cover some of that tonight. We're gonna talk about um, the importance of dark skies. We're gonna talk about what we all can do uh, to protect the dark skies. And so if we're going to talk about all this, we need to have some experts. And we have an amazing lineup tonight. Um, first, Dean Regis. And Dean, we were just talking about this, and I, I said it the wrong way, Dean Regis. Uh, <laughs> Dean is an is a old Ohio friend, but he's also been astronomer residence at the Grand Canyon um, a couple of years ago, but he's back now and kind of is a, a lone gig. So he's at the Canyon right now. Um, he was the director of the Cincinnati Observatory for 23 years, co-host of the syndicated PBS tele television show Stargazers, and um, author of several books. And and so we're really pleased to have you tonight, Dean. And then oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Kevin, and uh, Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon Conservancy, and and Lowell. Uh, glad to be here from uh, right in the Grand Canyon. Yeah, you're you're right in the thick of the dark skies. That's for sure. And then also joining us is, you know, I don't want to embarrass Chris, but uh, really a legend in Northern Arizona because Flagstaff, as many of you know, is the world's first international dark sky city. And Chris was one of the leaders in making that happen and continues to be a leader in the dark sky movement, not just in Northern Arizona, but across the entire continent. Um, he was a longtime astronomer at the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station um, here, uh, I don't know, four miles from Lowell Observatory, um, one of the founders of the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. I think, Chris, you're president now, I think, again. Um, he helped found the Night Visions art exhibit, um, which we can talk about a little bit. He also won the 2020 Viola Award for Excellence in STEAM. Uh, the Viola Award is the Northern Arizona um, awards that go out every year um, celebrating the arts and sciences in Northern Arizona. Um, and Chris is also uh, the principal of Dark Skies Partners, um, which uh, he founded to promote the dark skies. Um, so really great to have you guys here tonight and to talk about dark skies. Um, this is such an important topic, um, but as we're finding, it's, it's important not just for astronomers, um, but for so many others on, on Earth. When I say others, I talk about humans, non-humans, um, is such a critical thing. So we want to talk about that some tonight. So Dean, let's start with you. Just um, I, I mentioned that you're you were at the Cincinnati Observatory for uh, more than half your life, or pretty darn close, and you just recently stepped down to pursue, um, I think, world travel and share the word of astronomy everywhere. Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself and and also how your interest in astronomy started, as well as dark sky preservation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, my background in astronomy is a little roundabout, that's for sure. It's uh, not your typical uh, path towards astronomy. I, I started off in, uh, in college being, I wanted to be a high school history teacher and uh, well, did my student teaching and figured out I don't want to be a high school history teacher. And so I had to try to find some other uh, vocation and stumbled upon astronomy. I was working at a planetarium, doing planetarium shows, and just fell in love with the subject and learned all that I could. So I just dove in. I'm uh, pretty much completely self-taught and uh, turned this into a career. I, I worked at the Cincinnati Observatory for uh, 23 years and doing mostly astronomy education. Uh, but uh, I uh, yeah, recently stepped down because I wanted to do some other things. I want to do some personal projects. I want to do more writing. And most importantly, I wanted to come to places like this, like the Grand Canyon, to be in a dark sky. Because uh, as much as I love Cincinnati, uh, the city is awesome. The cloud cover is not great. And the light pollution is not great. Uh, so uh, one of my... Uh, most recent experiences was uh, I was here at the Grand Canyon for the star party for the annual star party where they 
uh, have dozens and dozens of uh, amateur astronomers and professional astronomers come set up telescopes. And uh, it's just such a wonderful whole week of, of viewing, uh, working with the public, really dark skies. And then I went back to Cincinnati and I gave a program at the observatory and it was clear that it was clear skies. But the only thing we could see was the moon, Vega and Arcturus. And, you know, uh, Kevin, I had to say I, you know, that was a moment for me. I thought, you know, there are better places in this uh, country where I could go to see really dark skies. And so that's what my hope is, is that I can kind of uh, advocate for this even more and uh, also kind of seek out these, these amazing places and encourage other people to do the same. Well, that's great. And, and we're certainly glad that you're branching out because um, you're, you're kind of a member of the family here at Lowell Observatory and the Grand Canyon. And it's, it's always great to see you come, coming back and sharing your enthusiasm and your stand-up astronomy comedy, um, which is always uh, very popular. Also. That, that, that is one of, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still working on my stand-up routine. I got about a five minute, well, actually my, my tour of the universe is a whole 45 minute stand-up routine. But anyway, you also learn some things as well. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm working, working on my, working on the comedy. So uh, still got a little ways to go. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, this is great timing because we just got a question in from Bill down in Phoenix um, asking, can someone define dark skies for me? And maybe that's a reasonable question from somebody from Phoenix, because like you in Cincinnati on a good night, this quote unquote dark in Phoenix, you might see the moon, um, but, but not a lot else. So if we're going to define dark skies, I can't think of a better person than Chris Luganbuehl, who has championed dark skies um, for his entire career here in Flagstaff. So Chris, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit about how you got into astronomy and then define dark skies for Bill and all of us. Well, thank you, Kevin. And nice to meet you, Dean. We're, uh, we're just getting acquainted here uh, in real time here on this program. I haven't met Dean before. Uh, anyway, thank you again, Kevin. My history in astronomy, actually during high school, most of the time I thought I was gonna be a biologist. Uh, toward the end of high school, I started, I like, I like, I like science fiction a lot. So I thought, well, I'm going to be an exobiologist. I'm going to, I'd like to study living things on other planets because I just love the narratives and the stories I read about the imagination involved in seeing what, thinking about what life might be like on other planets. But then when I got to the point of having to decide a direction to go for a career, um, I realized that uh, exobiology was kind of a, a, a subject without a, without a topic or a topic without a subject. And I didn't anticipate there would be any uh, living organisms in other planets that I could look at in my lifetime. So I drifted into astronomy. I think I was probably inspired as I recall, and it's hard to recall with certainty things that are uh, when you're young, but I re seem, seem to recall when I was about eight years old, there was, I think, a blackout or a brownout in the area where I lived and grew up. And that was in the Philadelphia, Wilmington, Delaware area where there wasn't a lot of dark skies either. The skies were not dark anyway. And when that blackout happened, I remember being stunned by a sky full of stars. That's just a carpet of stars. And it made an impression on me. And I have a feeling that that sense of awe that I, I got then, that wonderment and that perception of the immensity of the universe around me really probably led a lot to my not only interest in science fiction and exobiology, but then ultimately into astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, I came uh, to Flagstaff, Arizona after high school and have been here more or less ever since, except for a time in graduate school in, in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I, as Kevin mentioned, I worked at the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station for my, my entire career, pretty much 33 years. Uh, during that time, I did a lot of research in kind of uh, esoteric topics like uh, gamma ray bursters and brown dwarfs and very faint stars, star forming regions. But as time went on, um, I became more and more involved in what we'll call dark skies. Um, the reason I became involved is because the observatory that I worked at um, is about, as Kevin mentioned, I believe about four or five miles outside of the, well, from the city hall, only a couple miles outside of the city limits. And when the observatory was established, my observatory was established in the mid-50s, it was dark. 
uh, the observatory from Washington, D.C., the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., where the observatory had been located exclusively until then, was looking for a dark location to put their large telescopes. And they felt that Flagstaff was a good location. Lowell Observatory was already here. Flagstaff only had about 8,000 uh, inhabitants. And I've seen it written uh, that the general perception was that it probably could never really grow very much because there's no water out here. <laughs> And now we're crossing 10 times that. Flagstaff's population now is in the neighborhood of 80,000. Uh, and in the mid 80s, it became clear that the observatory was not going to stay dark. And in fact, there was a proposal for some new development relatively near the observatory. And in the discussion that ensued at the observatory about the potential impact of that development, we basically made a decision that we thought that dark skies weren't something that we should just run from which we felt had been the traditional approach of astronomers over the last century or more. As lighting encroached, then you'd just go somewhere else where it was darker. In fact, that's what the Naval Observatory did in the 1950s when it came to Flagstaff. But we decided that wasn't really the only solution. We thought that dark skies could be manageable. And that really initiated my involvement with dark skies, trying to figure out what causes light pollution, what aspects of the way lighting is used are more important than other aspects? How much can you hope to mitigate it if you actually mitigate the, if you actually control the way lighting is used in practical ways? So that's kind of, that's my history. And I've been involved also with the local community group, uh, both while I was still at the observatory and since I retired, uh, which is seeking the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition, which is seeking to broaden the conception of dark skies and their value throughout the community. So the people don't tend to think of it as just something which is great and they're glad to do it for the astronomers and the observatories, but rather think that it's something of value to them as well. Now, so what is dark skies as, uh, as Bill Smith asked? Well, dark skies, what is the dark sky and what is dark skies? Those are two questions that are a little bit different in my mind. Dark skies in general describes the topic that we're gonna be talking about tonight. And it's kind of a catch all and it is kind of gotten this name because it was, in that, it was initiated by astronomers who were really focused on the sky overhead and how dark it is. But as we've learned more about dark skies, we've realized that there are many other dimensions to the problem. There are ecological dimensions to the problem. There are energy dimensions to the problem. There are even lighting visibility dimensions. In other words, when you use lighting at night, how well can you see? How well do you need to see? All these topics are part of what I'd call the dark skies topic overall. But what is a dark sky? And I think that's really what uh, Bill was asking about. Uh, a lot of people think that a sky loses, a, a dark sky loses its ability to make a deep impression on people once it becomes bright enough that the Milky Way is no longer visible. Uh, that's certainly the case in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Uh, Milky Way is long since not visible in most of the city. Uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, of population 80,000 or so, uh, the Milky Way, as long as you're not standing under a steep street light, even in downtown, is visible uh, in the summer and even in the winter in most places. Uh, so it's still what I would call a dark sky. Uh, we'll talk about whether that, how much of that is inevitable uh, in Phoenix, for example, and I'm going to try to make an argument that you'd be stunned how much of that is not in inevitable. And we'll talk about that, I hope, in a little, in a little while. Uh, it's remarkable how much you can improve it by addressing the issues of how lighting is used. Uh, but I hope that uh, it helps uh, understand what we're talking about tonight. The topic of dark skies and all its manifold directions or dim dimensions and also, what is a dark sky? Thanks, Chris. And you had, you had mentioned, you know, Phoenix, you can't see the Milky Way. It's been a while since you've can. But in fact, something like 80% of the world lives in a place that you cannot see the Milky Way. And that's a pretty staggering number uh, when we think about it. Um, it. It also tells you where people are concentrated. But it's easy to see that, isn't it? If you look at a, a satellite map of the world, you can tell you can define where the countries and big cities are based on light pollution. Right, right. The the lighting the lighting that you see from orbit not only shows you where the light pollution is, of course, but it shows you where the people are because that's where 
So we live yeah. under our lights naturally. We don't light up the back of the back country. So yeah, it is, it, it is something like 80% um, uh, that live under skies that are considered light polluted to some degree. And that's, uh, that's not necessary. And I hope we can convey mm -hmm. that tonight. Uh, so Dean, large, we, large part is not necessary. Yeah. Dean, uh, Chris was mentioning about, you know, how this started as a issue for astronomers, but we've learned a lot more about the negative impacts of artificial light. Can you talk a little bit about that and what we've, you know, kind of what we've been learning the last several years, decade or two about, about the negative impact of artificial light? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's pretty well established about uh, how it affects the animal kingdom, especially uh, animals that are, you know, dependent on darkness and that lights kind of mess up their patterns uh, that they've been used to for all these years. Uh, I think for for humans, uh, it is it, it's it's one of those things that you know, from living in a city for my entire life, you don't even think of the possibility of seeing the Milky Way. I mean, there's not even, it's not even part of your growing up as a kid, even thinking that that's something that you can even do. Um, and I think that's one of the things about kind of getting the word out about this is that, yeah, it doesn't have to be that way, that you don't, it doesn't have to be that you go to the middle of nowhere to be able to find a dark sky, that this, these the things can work, that it can work where people are and still do this. But I, I think that what I see is that when I tell people in, in Cincinnati about my travels that I go out to places where it's darker, I can see the Milky Way. Uh, it is amazing the the responses. It, it's something that I think people want to be able to do. And unfortunately right now, it's something that for the vast majority of people, they have to take a trip for. They have to take a extensive trip to go to places. Um, so, uh, you know, for uh, us in the Midwest, we've got cities everywhere. Um, and uh, usually if somebody says, well, where's the closest place you could go? Uh, I usually say Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which is uh, from Cincinnati, about an eight hour, nine, 10 hour drive. And th that's very sad to have to think that's how far you have to go to get to a truly dark sky. Now there's some exceptions and there's some little pockets where you can find some little darker skies, but light pollution will kind of seep from city to city if it's big enough. So I, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's one of those things where if, for, for folks like me, for, you know, city bound folks that uh, it, it's, it's in our mindset, or at least it's, it, we're open to the idea of this, that, that we can find these places, that we'd find these like little oases of places where it's dark. And that's not the ideal step that we want to be in, that you know, we want to be able to actually solve the problems where we are. But uh, it's like little steps at a time, one, one after the other. Now, the one that I'm really interested to find out to see how it's going, and maybe you all know about this too, is that the you know, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is taking steps to become a dark sky city also. Uh, at least it was uh, talked about in the International Dark Sky Association or Dark Sky is uh, is involved with that. And, I, you know, being from Cincinnati, we have a slightly weird rivalry with Pittsburgh. It's like Pittsburgh is our like evil twin, but they don't really care about us that much. So it's like a one way rivalry. But anyway, that's beside the point. But what I like to tell us people in Cincinnati is that people in Pittsburgh can do this and people in Cincinnati can do it too. try to get their their civic pride going against uh, their their rival <laughs> out east. But I, it's it's I'm really curious to see how that goes in a in a bigger metropolitan area. Um, because how it worked in Flagstaff is just amazing. Like, like Chris said, yeah, you can be downtown and, uh, see the Milky Way from Lowell Observatory. It was even, I was even there, Kevin, on a partly cloudy night. I could still see the Milky Way. Uh, yeah. it was just, uh, it's just amazing that, that, that can be done in even a, a community that large. And that's a, that's a good point that it's, it is possible and, you know, Flagstaff was a leader in it, but you had mentioned a couple of places, you know, if you're living in Cincinnati, a couple of places that you can go for dark skies. Chris, maybe you can talk about this a little bit. Um, you know, the International Dark Sky Association that Dean mentioned has a listing of dark sky um, communities and parks and so on. 
And maybe you can talk about that a little bit, how people can find out where closed dark site, dark sky places are. And, and it kind of ties into with a couple of questions we had here of um, the best dark sky parks and then some, you know, what some that might be in Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area, for instance. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, certainly people can go to the uh, International Dark Sky Association or dark, now it's called Dark Sky International website and look up for their programs and find where they have designated parks and communities, et cetera, as dark sky places. But I would, I would, uh, and I wouldn't want to try to guess which ones are the best. I don't think that's really very important. If somebody wants to see dark skies, don't worry about going to the best one. In fact, you don't even have to go to a place that's been designated. Get away from your city and get away from lights. Even if you're in the East Coast where there's one city after another seemingly running together and when you look at the light pollution maps, it seems like the whole place is bright. If you get away from a city and you know where a rural place is in your area, go there and find a place where you can see a large piece of the sky. It may not be what you would see at Grand Canyon National Park or the best dark sky place, but it will still make an impression on you. It will still contribute value to your life. And you might then later maybe decide to go buy one of those more, more pristine places later when you have the opportunity. And it might be an eight hour drive like Dean talked about. Uh, but in general, if you only go for the best ones, you probably are very rarely going to do it. And I encourage you to do it more frequently and go for something which is not quite the best, but will still be very impressive to you if you were living under a bright sky. Um, in Texas, yeah, in Texas, there's the McDonald Observatory, which is near Fort Davis. I think the Big Bend Park is also maybe a dark sky park, and it's certainly dark there anyway, whether it is a dark sky park or not. A lot of places in rural Texas will be dark, though, as long as you can get on property where somebody's not going to come shoo you away. Yeah. And I, I think you make a great point of you, there are these designated sites, but but really for convenience, you know, why wait two years so you can save up for a trip when you can do it sooner and just drive outside away from the lights? Um, and then and then maybe when you have an opportunity, go to a special place like Grand Canyon. Well, Northern Arizona, the skies are dark, but Grand Canyon um, is a favorite place, I think, for all of us because, Dean, you can talk about this a little bit. You know, during the daytime, you have these mile layer of rocks that you're looking back in time. And then at nighttime, when it darkens, you're looking up at a dark sky and you're kind of doing the same thing, looking back in time in a different way. But what, what does that mean to you to be at the Grand Canyon for, for you know, as the astronomer residents and just as a is a human being. Oh yeah, I mean it is. It's it's uh, rejuvenating basically to come here and see, like you said, the the daytime and then the nighttime. And you know the parks have really been embracing this idea. Uh, this, this catchphrase: half the park is after dark, because a lot of visitors. I mean the vast, vast, vast majority of visitors to national parks come during the day. They take their pictures. They go out because there's only so many facilities for people to stay at overnight. And so to be able to actually stay multiple nights, you know, even, you know, in my case, in my case, uh, weeks uh, in the park is so uh, it's life changing. It's you, you see a whole different aspect to this most beautiful, one of the most beautiful parks in the world. Uh, because you get the daytime and you hike, uh, hike and hike and hike and see these unbelievable vistas and views. But then equally good is the view at night and seeing a, a, a whole sea of stars up above. And uh, the, one of the more memorable uh, occasions that I had doing my astronomy residency is I would set up uh, a telescope just you know, in places where people would be coming by, we call it sidewalk astronomy. And so I would set out a telescope right outside of the El Tovar the hotel and restaurant uh, right there uh, on the South Rim. And people would come out uh, from the, the lit interior outside, look up and see all these stars, and you could just hear their reactions. And then they, they come up to me and look through the telescope and I can show them Saturn or the double cluster or something like that. And their eyes just light up. And 
I, I can't tell you how many times somebody said to me, they said, this was the best part of my trip. And, and I, I, the first time I heard it, I, I said, wait a second, you, you know, there's a, can, a canyon right back there, right? You know, like a, a mile deep thing. And you think the sky is the best thing. And they said, absolutely. And I heard this over and over and over again. And, it, you know, because I thought, oh, it's just me. I like the sky. I like the stars. And this is, but I, I think people, when they get that experience, it, it, it is memorable. It is equal, if not more memorable than uh, taking your picture from the South Rim, uh, but to actually see the sky. Um, and so, boy, man, when I, that, uh, you, you get hooked on experiences like that. You, that's why I want to keep coming back and, and sharing this with more people. So, so we want more communities to be like this. I mean, the Grand Canyon is a designated dark sky park. Um, so they've, you know, done lighting uh, modifications and such to fit in these criteria. But there, there are things that communities of different sizes and parks and, and such do to, to improve um, their dark skies. Chris, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what, what it means and what, what people can do um, either whether individuals or communities, you know, um, city organizations or whatever, what, what can be done to improve dark skies? And yeah. is it a one-way street or can you go back? Yeah. Um, so I hope that the listeners or the viewers are noticing that even though there are three people here who work or have worked at observatories and are to various degrees associated with professional astronomy, this is not, I hope people understand, this is, we hope it's not taken as just an astronomer's concern. Um, I often, when we talk about 80% of the country not being, or the, of the world not being out, living where they can't see the Milky Way and missing that inspiration and awe that you get when you just look up and think about what you're looking at. Uh, I would say that it's, it's I, I really very much appreciate it when communities or people say it's important to protect that so that astronomers can learn more about the universe around us and tell us about it and learn more science, publish more papers. Uh, thank you very much. But there's only a few thousand of us in the country and 80% of 300 and whatever million we are in this country, none of those can see the sky uh, the way they should at night. And I think that really in the grand scheme of thing matters much more than professional astronomy. Uh, so what can we do about that? One thing that I think is important to realize is that dark skies, although it was a topic, I think, that was raised or created as, an, as a thing to think about by astronomers or people who used to be astronomers, probably about the time the International Dark Sky Association was founded back in the mid 80s, uh, nearly 40 years ago now. Uh, uh, it's become clear that this is a much broader concern, not just to people, but also more than just the brightness of the sky, as we talked about earlier a little bit. Um, one of the things that was very clear right from the very beginning, without too much quantification, but just common sense, was that, boy, if you look around at light, the way we use it at night, and think about whether it's being used sensibly, and really, it's just three concepts. Is it the right amount of light? Is it too much or too little, or the right amount? Is it in the right place? Is it just lighting the area you need to be? And is it at the right time? The right amount, the right place at the right time. And with those three concepts, which a third grader could get, if you go out and look at the lighting in your community, you will be stunned at how little people who are doing that lighting seem to have that common sense of a third grader. There's light shining in your eyes. There's light shining up. There's lights that are on when nobody is using it. There's lights that are way too bright. Um, in some places. And probably in a few places, there's like places where it should be light. Although those are less common, I think, than the places that are overlit. What has become clear in the 35 or 40 years since then, uh, as we've tried to quantify which of these different aspects of lighting have the worst impacts on our sky, is that it's not some of the simplest things to do, like shielding, are pretty, pretty effective at darkening skies. In fact, if you, the research shows that if you take all the lights in your community and shield them all, so they all shine only onto the ground or onto the area they intend to light, which is 99% of the time the ground, 
you would cut light pollution to the sky by about 50%. That's not 5%. It's 50%. I mean, you can get an Energy Star certification for your computer by saving 5 or 10% of the energy over a regular computer. We're talking 50% just from shielding lights. Overlighting turns out in some, and it might be worse now than when I did research that quantified this in Flagstaff. Overlighting, actually, if you could take all the overlit places out there and replace them with just enough light rather than too much light, and the kind of places that come to mind are like a service station or convenience source, which can you know, be as brightly illuminated literally as a office at night. Some people say it looks like they're, uh, like they're brightly illuminated as an operating theater. But if you replace all those with sensibly illuminated uh, levels, it's probably only about a 25% reduction. But the, the thing that turns out to be the biggest one that wasn't even fully aware uh, realized back in the 80s when this dark sky movement started is the spectrum of the light. It turns out that if you use a sensible spectrum, and we'll, we might get a chance to talk about that tonight, a spectrum that gives you good visibility but doesn't cause so much sky glow, and it turns out there's a way to do that, gives you good visibility on the ground, ability to find your way in a parking lot or on a road, but causes less sky glow, you can reduce sky glow by 70%. And I have a, if you, if I don't know if now is the appropriate time to share that graph I have, Kevin, which yeah, shows good. those effects. This we, is made a, no prom, we made no promises that we wouldn't share any numbers or graphs. So go ahead. Okay. This is this is a uh, a, a figure that's on the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition uh, web pages under uh, lighting codes. And this figure shows the benefits that you can get from these different uh, aspects of more sensible lighting. So on the leftmost side, you see, let's say that an unregulated light, uh, a community with unregulated lighting, they never made any special efforts to shield it or to limit how much was used or cared about the spectrum. Let's say that's 100 units. I guess the, the scale of this might be cut off on the left side, but let's take that as 100% on the top of that full blue bar. So if you reduce the overlighting, you might reduce it 25%, the amount of light getting into the sky. And as I said, if you shield it, you can cut it by 50%. The spectrum, if you switch, and it turns out that what you want to do for the best spectrum is to use amber colored lighting for the majority of applications where accurate color perception is not important, like on a roadway where you have headlights to see colors anyway, or in parking lots where you really just need to find your car. You don't need to choose a fresh tomato versus a not quite so ripe tomato or choose a car that you'd like to buy that has a nice color versus one that doesn't have a nice color. If you use amber lighting for much of that, you can reduce the, the, the sky glow by 70%. If you multiply all three of those together, that's 90% reduction, 90%. So, Back to our friend in, in Phoenix, Arizona, when I, uh, if he's still listening to us, I hope he is. Uh, and he's thinking, oh, it's just, what, what can I do? I live in the middle of a 5 million metropolis, uh, 5 million inhabitants. You know what, if you could imagine, and I know this is a little bit of a stretch for our, for our brains, pulling all that light out and then replacing it with all night friendly lighting, still able to see just as well on the ground and do just as much as you did before you could cut the sky brightness by 90%. Now, in downtown Phoenix, that's not going to bring the Milky Way back, but you might go from a dozen stars to three dozen stars. I'm making numbers up for illustration. But the footprint of Phoenix, and Dean mentioned this earlier, that the large cities, their lighting footprint spreads into the surrounding countryside, that would shrink by 90% also. And when you cut, when you cut the radius of something, let's imagine it's a circle, and let's say you had to drive 100 miles before to get to a dark sky. Now you might only have to drive 10 miles outside the city. And the footprint of the city will drop more than 90%. It will drop 90.9 uh, square. It'll drop, it'll, uh, you know, point, uh, I've lost myself on my own figures. But anyway, the footprint of the city goes down to about 1% of what it was. So it's a huge benefit that should be within reach for most communities like Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or other cities that are willing to do the sensible things with lighting. 
So Chris, you've, you've been involved with this since the beginning of the dark sky movement or pretty darn close. Um, how, how has public perception changed over time as this has changed from just an astronomer issue um, to, to life on earth in general? And also, you know, talking about, you know, some of the early concerns about lighting was, oh, the cost to change the lights or, oh, it's not safe with less lighting. I don't feel safe out there. How has that kind of perception changed over time? It's a constant struggle, Kevin. I think it's improving, uh, but a lot of it is perception driven and even information sometimes is hard to re-steer perceptions. But I have a simple argument that helps to answer the overall questions. Yes, is it safe or not safe? Uh, are people, is crime gonna go up or not go up? And those are very difficult questions to answer. People have done research on it and then we could talk about that kind of endlessly and somebody else could find an example which maybe makes it sound like it goes the other way. But I have, a, I have, a, I have an example or an analogy. If I wanted to teach you about uh, Einstein's theory of gravity and how gravity works, I don't need to teach you tensor calculus. I don't need you to teach you Einstein's general theory of relativity. You know what I have to do? I have to grab an apple in my hand, I have to reach it out over the floor, and I have to let go of it. And it falls to the floor, just like Newton noticed. So we know that gravity exists. Flagstaff has done the same thing for lighting. We have done most of those things. And in fact, our sky is about 90% fainter, a little bit more than uh, some of the other, the, another city we compared to, uh, which was a similar size, uh, but had not done anything special with regard to lighting controls. We're about 90% fainter. So, and Flagstaff doesn't have any unusual crime problem. Commerce goes just fine in Flagstaff. We have plenty of franchises. In other words, Home Depot didn't say, oh, you have such strict lighting rules, we're not gonna go to Flagstaff. We have dropped the apple for light pollution. We have shown people that this is something that can be done and it's not going to destroy your community. It's not going to make you unsafe. Now, all those discussions will still have to happen in any community that wants to consider adopting lighting codes and enforcing them to really improve their lighting and protect their skies and even improve their skies. But um, the, that example, we hope, really sure serves, as a, serves as a motivation, an inspiration, we hope, that other people can say, other communities can say, we ought to be able to do better. Mm -hmm. So Dean, you, you've worked with the public for two decades plus. How have you seen the, the attention to light pollution change and the, and the perception among, among just people who are coming out to you know, look at the dark sky? I would say that it's something that was not really on the radar for the audiences that I was uh, was working with. It, it there is a maybe there used to be this kind of perception of astronomy is is just for is just for the astronomers that there's a less accessibility to it, and I think that has changed tremendously in the last ten years. I think that that the, the rise of, of uh, social media has helped with this to kind of show that there's astronomy discoveries happening on a daily basis that are really um, capturing people's attention. And the I would say that the James Webb Space Telescope is the, the biggest driver of that in the last year or so. And I think it gets people out of their, their kind of neighborhoods and thinking a little more big picture. Um, and, and then kind of leading into the, well, you know, there's ways that you can do this too, that you can be part of astronomy, that you can, uh, take pictures of the night sky, uh, yourself. And, uh, I think one of the, the most, uh, recent examples is, I don't know if you all saw the, uh, the fellow in New York city that set up a telescope and I don't know if he blocked traffic or not. I'm not quite sure about the whole logistics of it, but he set up a telescope and made it sound like he blocked traffic to show people Saturn and everybody was incredibly amazed and all this stuff like that. And I think there's more of that happening than before. Uh, I, I feel like that uh, you know, wherever it's coming from, either it's from science educators, from observatories, from social media, that, that astronomy is, is part of our uh, the part of our daily lives even for for almost everybody um, 
and I would say, you know, that the, there's always the story that, you know, or that uh, every, every astronomy story is a good news story. So the media always loves astronomy mm -hmm. things. But I think it's also because the public loves it, too. I think that there are closet astronomers all across the country looking for an excuse, looking for an opportunity to uh, do this. When I, I mean, when I was a kid, I never got a chance to look through a telescope. I never knew where there was a telescope that I could even go look through. There were clubs in my hometown, but I never heard about them and I never was introduced to them. And I think getting more of the public kind of just showing that this is so accessible, I think is, is really valuable. Um, so I, what I think I've seen also in the last three, four, five years, and I, you know, I, I think the COVID might have a little bit to do with this as well, is that people were stuck at home for long periods of time and they started kind of dreaming about what else could be possible, what else is out there. And, for me, I, I was, uh, you know, the night sky was a great solace during COVID is, you know, that was the, your way to get out. That was your way to see things. And I think a lot of people kind of looked at that and said, you know, astronomical travel, I think is, is going to be a, is already a, a big deal. And I think getting bigger and bigger, which, uh, you know, uh, for for any uh, decision makers out there and and government folks, that's going to bring a lot of people to Arizona. And I, you know, and I think uh, astro tourism for dark skies that is another tangential yeah. benefit for this. So if you're looking for uh, you know for things to uh, entice people, astro tourism I believe is going to be a big thing going in going in the near future. And it, and it definitely is, like you said, in Arizona, um, not just here in Flagstaff, but across the state um, from Tucson with, you know, Kitt Peak National Observatory. Um, we, we think of public observatories where people go like Kitt Peak or here in Flagstaff, a little observatory, but there are so many research facilities in Arizona. It's really a hotbed for astronomical research also across the state. And yeah, it drives a lot of money through the state, through the coffers. Um, so that's really important. Um, Chris, we were, I, and I should just say, we've got about 20 minutes to go um, in this special program about dark skies protection. Um, the program co-hosted by Grand Canyon National Park, Grand Canyon Conservancy, Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition and Low Observatory. So for those listening, again, if you wanna send in questions, please do that. We have. 15 or 20 minutes to go, and we'll um, answer any other questions that come up. Um, Chris, you were talking about, uh, you know, for, for people who want to see dark skies, it's nice to go to a, you know, a really great place, but the first thing is just to get outside, drive down the road, find a dark site, dark place. So what can people do to learn more about the dark skies movement and what they can do? And um, what kind of resources are out there, um, websites, clubs, groups, that sort of thing? Well, there are, if you type dark skies on the web, you'll find lots of resources. The Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition thinks they have a fairly nice uh, website that has information which is specifically focused on practical solutions that can help you achieve a result along the lines of Flagstaff. Uh, but there are plenty of other sites as well. The International Dark Sky Association or Dark Sky International has a website. Many organizations, there's another one I'm aware of called the Illinois Coalition for Responsible Outdoor Lighting. They have informative material as well. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize though that came to mind when Dean was talking about how there's such a broad interest in astronomy. I, I hope that our, that I'd like our viewers to recognize that astronomy isn't owned by astronomers. Astronomy is, some have said, the oldest science and in fact, it didn't used to be called astronomy. It used to be called astrology. And it has, his, has roots back through the millennia before we even think of science in the modern sense of existing at all. But I think people should not forget that they have access to that aspect of the universe that they live in, whether or not they understand astrophysics or care about astrophysics, or they memorize the distances in light years or trillions of miles to stars or the temperatures just looking up at the night sky and understanding the basic concepts of what's up there 
is meaningful, hugely meaningful to many, many people, most people. There are few, I think, who are not awestruck by looking at a star-filled sky, or even a, a sky that's not uh, absolutely pristine, but still got a thousand stars in it, let's say, instead of 5,000. So I hope people accept that, recognize that, and value that, because that feeling of, own, of, of entitlement, of value, is something that really has to underlie any effort to improve things. We have understood for 35 or more years the basic ideas, most of the basic ideas about how to protect skies, shield the lights, use them in the right place, right time, et cetera. But it's not been happening. In fact, the, the bad news is there's been a lot of papers in the last five years or so based on satellite measurements or other kinds of measurements, uh, people looking at stars and counting them, for example, but show that light pollution continues to get worse pretty much everywhere. In fact, there was a, an article by Chris Kaiba and others in Science Magazine, I think it was just uh, this spring, saying that it was deteriorating over the last 10 years at about 10% a year, about doubling every 10 years, eight or 10 years. That's the bad news. The good news is it doesn't have to be like that. There is so much room to improve it that as time goes on, Kevin, you asked the question about what can you do when it's already kind of wrecked where you live. Well, it turns out that on a time scale of decades, lights wear out and they get replaced. And particularly they will get replaced if there's a motivation to do it. So if you are in, in your community and you're concerned about dark skies, recognize that probably many of your fellow citizens are as well. You don't have to have observatories. You don't have to have astronomers. Get out there and research it, gather people of like mind together make your case that this is something that matters to your community. It's beneficial whether you just like to look at stars or whether you'd like to decrease your carbon footprint or whether you'd like to decrease your energy bills or improve the visibility on your streets, et cetera. It's beneficial from every perspective. If what we are trying to do is properly understood, we are not trying to turn out everybody's lights. We're just trying to make people use lights sensibly. You'll notice that graph that I had there didn't say anything about turning lights out and we still got 90% better. So uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question you, you posed before me, Kevin, but I, I had that runoff on that particular tangent. No, that's great. And I, you know, that's such a big part of it is, is understanding this is, this is everybody, this is all of us. And, you know, I really see, see people getting connected to the sky. I, I think, I don't know, seeing visitors through the years, a little observatory, I think there's some level of wanting to reconnect with the universe around us we're so in tune with staring at our phones all the time and the technology that sometimes we need to just break away and absorb the universe around us. And, uh, you know, every, every, gosh, I don't know how many times this has happened through the years. I'll be up at Lowell and, you know, the Lowell Observatory is right over downtown Flagstaff. And yet it's still so dark up there. You can see the Milky Way very easily. Um, unless the moon is really shining bright that night. But I don't know how many times I've seen people tear up because they've seen the Milky Way. And it's it's such a powerful experience. And I love the ones where, you know, it's a clear night and, and I get a question, oh, I thought it was supposed to be clear tonight. I see it's cloudy. And that's the, that's the center of the Milky Way. And it's right. really, I think we've all experienced that profound moments like that. Um, where, you know, I don't think any of us on the skull take this, take it for granted, but we certainly were used to seeing dark skies and we don't see them. We start to squirm a little bit maybe, um, but people that don't live in those areas that can't see them, it's, it's really an eye-opening experience. Um, yeah. It's so important we'll just, for, I, I, oh. for people to realize, all three of us want to have something here. Yeah. It's important for people to realize that this is not something inevitable. It really can be made better. And the reason, the fundamental driver for making it better is enough people caring about it. Yeah, I was wondering if, um, you know, so Kevin, you've lived in Flagstaff for a while, like it, it and, and it's, the population has grown quite a bit since you've probably been there. So did you notice any changes? Like, did it get darker at a certain point or uh, was it, was it like, you know, was it bad in the bad old days and then it got better or do any changes that you noticed in the lighting? 
you know, I moved here in 1995, and um, I didn't I didn't really notice so much until I started working at Lowell Observatory. But you know, it was it was when I moved here, it was clearly darker even back then than places of similar size where I've either lived or visited. What's neat now is, you know, in the last couple of decades, when I go traveling somewhere and I come up, you know, drive up by 17 and there's the San Francisco peaks um, and you get to Flagstaff and it's, it's startling how dark it is. And yet, you know, we do this all the time. My wife and I, we think, my gosh, we're back home. Look how dark it is. But you can still see, you know, the, you know, the driveways, the sidewalks, the, you know, it feels safe. It's just a lot darker. And, and it, it, it's just a natural thing you look up. You know, the darker it is, you, you look up. It's just a natural reaction to it. And, you know, the more places that can do that, I think the better. And, yeah, and I've noticed it in uh, Grand Canyon because it was yeah. – maybe five, six, seven years ago where they were, you know, getting their provisional designation as a dark sky. And once you do that, you have to do steps to make it even better. And I, it was, uh, you know, I noticed it right away coming back after COVID. So I think I came in 2019 for their star party and then didn't come back again until 2022. And you walk around and it is noticeably darker. I mean, they made this effort and the rangers here, uh, especially uh, a ranger named Raider Lane, who's made this uh, great effort to do this. And man, it's noticeable. Like you're walking outside the hotels in the busiest part and you can still see a whole mess of stars. It is so dark. Um, and so uh, even in a short period of time in a park that, was probably pretty dark before that they can even still make it better. It's, it's, it's impressive. And you know, what I think is so neat at the Canyon is you can be outside at night and there's enough light from stars that you can see into the Canyon. And, you know, I mean, you can't see it as much as daytime, but you, you can see it there. And then you're looking up at the night sky, you're, you're experiencing both of them at the same time. And it, it's a it's a surreal feeling for sure. Now tonight we we've been talking mostly about um, ground based light pollution, um, artificial light and such. But we have a question that really ties into something we wanted to get to before we leave, um, and that's light artificial light pollution from above us up in the sky. We have more more and more satellites going up, um, communication satellites, um, and you know, it's another one of these things that are going up and more people around the world are able to communicate. That's a good thing, but stuff comes at a price sometimes. And um, that is more light pollution. Um, Chris, as a, as a professional astronomer, or you recently played one on TV, at least before you <laughs> retired, um, what, what's it like for the professional astronomers, especially with um, all the artificial satellites? And is that is that as big of a problem, you know, on Earth as, you know, the ground-based light pollution? Well, the satellites that the question refers to, the Starlink satellites, are in low Earth orbit. They're about, I don't know, they're they're about a thousand pound satellites. They're not they're not huge. Um, there are already about five thousand of them up. Um, ultimately, there could be more than twice that many. When they first go into orbit, they are relatively low down and they are very bright and easily visible to people as the question refers to people noticing them. As they are maneuvered into their final orbits for this particular constellation of satellites, as it's called, how ironic, <laughs> uh, they are moved farther out and they become generally just fainter, a little bit fainter than you can see, except in very dark skies with a human eye. But to astronomers, uh, they are still very visible and they are all over the place up there. And particularly, there's a lot of interest in recent years and very wide field astronomy instruments that look at large pieces of the sky and try to map down to very faint levels, much fainter than you and I can see, what is different every night from night to night. These are very ambitious projects with very cutting edge instruments and they are severely impacted or can be severely impacted by these satellite constellations. 
Um, human beings, uh, less so. Initially, when they go up, as I said, they're bright, but then over the next several weeks uh, or months, they go to higher orbits and are fainter. Also, Starlink, I understand, has worked in some ways with the American Astronomical Society to try to darken the satellites so they don't reflect as much light. Uh, and I'm not sure what the final result of that is. It's somewhat helpful, I believe. But it's a real, it's a real conundrum. Uh, nobody really, it's the, as, as people in environmental law call it, it's a, if, I, if I have this phrase right, it's the classical crisis of the commons. Nobody owns the night sky, so therefore, a company who wants to use the night sky, there's nobody he has to ask permission from. You just he, you may be getting some idea who I'm referring to, just launches five thousand satellites and nobody can say no. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. Well, Chris Lugan Beal and Dean Rikas, we have about five minutes left, so let's take a couple of last questions about. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but you know, people becoming active and improving or learning about dark skies. And um, we have one question, are there any educational programs or initiatives at, at the Grand Canyon that aim to connect visitors with the cultural heritage of the park through the understanding of celestial events and the importance of dark skies? And one of our ranger friends at the canyon, Lauren, um, has responded, yes, there is that available. Um, I, you know, the, the I think to, to me is, visitors going to a place like Grand Canyon is the same as going to Lowell. And we get these comments all the time. Seeing the Grand Canyon or a place like Lowell is, can be life altering for people. But what really sticks with them is the human interaction while they were there. And just like educators at Lowell Observatory, Grand Canyon has remarkable rangers um, that interact with the public. And so you can look at something but to have it interpreted and put it to scale by somebody really sticks with you. And so that's the kind of thing that Grand Canyon does, um, supported by Grand Canyon Conservancy. Um, and then, you know, the rangers up there and visitors like Dean Regis, who's the astronomer in residence right now. Um, that's the whole thing is we all want to share in this. And we have this resource, whether it's the rocks of the canyon or the dark skies, but having, being able to talk to people and understand more and interact is really important. And that's something that the Canyon does really nicely. I have another question. I gotta, I gotta give a plug for Kevin too, who is a astronomer in residence as well here. Uh, and he's, uh, his work was trying to connect uh, with the history of the park, the, the human history uh, of the park very well. And so, uh, uh, I, I uh, wait, am I allowed to say, is there some uh, publication coming out from all this uh, or uh, in the works? There is a book coming out January 1st that's general Grand Canyon past and present images. And then another project in the works um, more focused on just the astronaut training on the Apollo astronauts that went there. And then some other hopeful things that we're working on right now. So let's, just let's just two, story. three, four, or five books, whatever. You know, it's a yeah. it's a normal year for Kevin. You know, well, well there's a lot of there's, there's so a, much great awesome stuff. project. Yeah, there's so many great things to do. Um, let's take one more question here um, from Caleb. We talked about this a little bit, um, but but maybe to drive this home, Chris, what's the biggest change we can make to help do our part in fighting light pollution? And I think we'll end with that. Your answer to that. I want to make one little pitch also before. You mentioned the Grand Canyon Star Party, but uh, coming up in a couple of weeks is the Flagstaff Star Party. And I'd like to invite everybody to go to flagstaffstarparty.org and learn about it and maybe come and visit. And but, can you also mention Night Visions? Because that's a really cool thing too. Well, not, yeah, Night Visions is a once every other year, usually a juried art exhibit, international submissions from around the world. Uh, celebrating the, the beauty and positive aspects of the night. And that's held in Flagstaff at the Coquito Center for the Arts every other year, typically. Um, that's not happening this year. Um, what I wanted to tell to uh, Caleb was, what is the biggest change we can make to help to, help to do our part in fighting light pollution? You know what I would say? First of all, care. Care about it and believe that what you care about matters and it isn't just some dismissible thing that only a few as crazy little people who like to look at stars care about. 
realize it's you and nearly everybody else. And if you, and then wake up your community to the value of these dark skies to everybody, and then tell them there's something that you can do about it. There is a 90% reduction available out there if you start working on it. And you can even grow, if you can reduce by 90%, you can continue to grow and still get darker. Well, that's great. That's a really great way to end it. You know, it's one thing to learn about things, but how can we, what can we do about it? And, and I think we've covered that nicely tonight. Uh, we could talk about this so long because it's such a fascinating and important topic. But as happens with this, um, time flew and our hour is up. So I'd like to thanks, uh, thank Dean Regis and Chris Luganbuehl for joining us in this really important conversation about protecting dark skies. And thank um, the kind of the co-conspirators of this program, Grand Canyon Conservancy, Grand Canyon National Park, a Lowell Observatory and the Flex of Dark Sky Coalition. And thanks to everybody for joining us. And we'll see you next time as we talk about other important things about the night sky. Thanks.